Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Star Citizen Addicts Anonymous. I am Nikki Batgirl D'Angelo. This is episode 26. Last episode we touched on a few things about um, that were controversial at the time, gifting changes. We touched upon people being able to store to steal organization assets. Um, didn't talk in depth about dogfighting module since Arena Commander is still with a ways away, maybe few weeks, maybe a month, maybe a few days. We don't know. We're still waiting. And that's why this show is pretty much mostly opinion, because although there's news, there's no really big, exciting news, right? This is starting to become the phony news era. You get a bunch of things that you got to talk about, but really nothing huge. Okay. So I'm going to get in depth with the first thing being gifting and just say that we put that to rest last week, right? So what's going on is that you can no longer gift a ship because it's after the 1st of May now if it's already been gifted to you. If you've just created an account, you have to wait 30 days before gifting. If you melt a ship and buy a new one with those funds, that ship will be marked as ungiftable. So you won't be able to gift anything bought with melted funds. And this is going to hurt some people like myself who do videos and try to you know send a ship to an alternate account so you could get a video review of a ship and its default hangar but also away from the rest of your ships so one of two things you get better frame rate or second one so people don't see how many ships you have and then try to steal your account which I heard was one of the reasons I shouldn't do it in my account but I'm not so certain about that anymore. With the interview over and Ben explaining things to us and me again off camera, there will be ways for you to gift in game when the time permits. Right now, resources are being dedicated to three things. Arena Commander, the version 1.5 of the organization system so we could have multiple organizations and to the social module and uh, mocap things or yeah I guess mocap things that are going on right now right full performance capture I should say so they have a lot of things going on so I'm confident that this will be fixed and that it's going to be perfectly amazing when it's done for the time being we just have to let it go and move on because we can't do anything to change it and these changes are protecting us Second piece was, and you know, I kind of threw that one at Ben and I don't think he was prepared for it. What do you think about um, people stealing your corporate assets? Well, we're going to tie those in just like we did last week with the multi, um, multiplayer and multiple organization thing. Um, if, it's going to happen one way or the other, right? It's happened in WoW, it's happened in EVE. It's happened in most games where people can infiltrate, get into your guild bank and make off with everything. I've read things on almost every one of the um, Tent on Hammer, you know, all the forums where this has happened in different games many times. It's going to happen in this game. The statement was that Chris said he condoned this behavior as being immersive. And I don't think that ever was said. I think what was said was that um, that was quite immersive and it would help the game along. But I don't think being that we spend, in some cases, some of you have spent thousands on ships, that they're gonna let somebody come in and steal those ships from you and that's gonna be immersive. That would be grand larceny, right? So what they are saying is that um, things that are bought with in-game currency, I'm reading between the lines, may be up for grabs, but the things that we paid um, real dollars for are not going to be. And this is something that will definitely not even be in play for 18 months. So anything said, anything countered, and anything countered to the counter is going to change a million times between now and game release. We still have all these other modules and Squadron 42 to get through before the Persistent Universe is alive. So we're going to leave that one, put it under the carpet, and not even worry about it until it's time. Until then, you know, the one thing I could tell you is be very careful, you know, be vet the people that are in your group, make sure that before anyone has access to anything, you know who they are. 
And maybe you diversify like we're trying to do in the enablers. No one person, even myself, has access to all the assets that the organization has. That way you can't just be blindsided and emptied of everything inside of the organization. And even that won't be enough, but at least it's something that you can do when the time arises. We're past that now, right? So multiple organizations, multiple multiplayer organizations, because we could always be in multiple organizations being, you know, maybe you're in LAMP or you're in my group, the enablers, maybe you're in Imperium, another great um, organization out there. And you feel that you want to be in another org because it's more social based and you could talk to friends there. There shouldn't be anything to stop you from doing that, right? Some people see multi multiple multiplayer organizations as being something that take people away from their group. I see it as being no different than somebody, you know, having a job, right? Maybe your job is being part of Imperium. And maybe your hobby in real life is doing model rocketry, model airplanes, pottery. Maybe you're a writer, maybe you're a photographer, and you're part of a photography group or one of the other clubs for that, right? So that would be what I see multi multiple multiplayer organizations being. But also think of it this way, maybe you're a person that's in a organization and there are going to be multiple um, NPC based organizations that you could be in also. You could be a bounty hunter, you can be a freelancer, you could be, you know, you can go on and on and list them off and still be in your organization. So this really isn't much different than being in an organization and an NPC organization. It's going to be something that just adds immersion and adds more to do than just being with that one org that you're in. It also gives the opportunity for organizations to split themselves up and possibly build in security for the second thing that we talked about. So maybe when you get into a group, you have the starter organization that you're part of until you prove yourself and then you're moved into the main organization after you've done so and they can trust that you're not gonna steal their assets. So you see how I'm working those two together? So they do go hand in hand, all right? Let's talk about the dogfighting module and I'm gonna give you a lot of opinion in this and I'm gonna go back to the 1980s. I was in uh, Southern Community College I had just lost my seat to Annapolis because of a medical reason. I had been nominated and accepted and didn't get in. And I was miserable and I fell into playing computer games when I was going to community college because all my eggs were in Annapolis in that one basket. I, uh, I started playing Elite on my Commodore Amiga. And Elite was one of those games that had the holy trinity of addictive things to me. It was space, it was RPG, it was fun. The one thing that got me after a while is the space combat was kind of repetitive. It was a twisting, turning, always going in one direction, shoot off a missile, fire a weapon, kill that guy, kill another guy, make money, go back to port. But I loved it. I played it over and over again. And I have to say, it was one of the first games where I actually woke up the next morning well, no, I didn't. I played through the night. It was one of the first games I played all the way through the night. And I loved Elite and played Elite 2 and Front, you know, Elite Frontier. And I played all of, all the Elites. And little by little, things got better and they added Newtonian physics to it over time. You could play with or without it. But it was playing you against the AI. And there is some kind of a uh, free-to-play version of one of the original Elites that was redone that you can go and find it. I think it's Elite Frontier. It was pretty fun. Um, Wing Commander came out, I played that, and again, it was one of those things where it turned out to be a twisting, turning nightmare of a um, combat, you know, space combat, but fun. And you didn't even dissect it and say it wasn't fun, even though it was just a twisting, twirling battle in space with no real, you know, once you learned the ship that you were fighting, you knew when he was going to make that special move he made and you already had something to counter it every time. And it got pretty repetitive, but Chris was able to hold your attention by building a lot more RPG stuff into the game and making it more fun, especially with the cinematics. All right, so let's talk about real combat, right? Real aerial combat. I've played 
Falcon, Falcon um, 4.0, Falcon AT, Falcon 3.0. I've played Jane's F-15, Jane's F-18, um, Joint Strike Fighter. I've played all these different games. The biggest ace in every one of these games is the ground. And it's the ground for one of three reasons. A, you stall and hit the ground. B, you dive so fast, you go to pull up and you don't, and you hit the ground. Or C, you're flying really low over the ground, don't see a tree, hit it and you blow up, right? <laughs> so it's the ground is the biggest ace. It's the biggest thing that gets in the way of everything. Now, if I look at Elite Dangerous, which is pretty fun right now, and some of the maps that you're playing, you're flying around, you know, space stations are flying around asteroids, and that adds that certain kind of flair into it. You have to keep your situational awareness, make sure you know where you're going, especially if you're using the Newtonian flip, you know, flipping yourself back, you know, on your axis so you can see the guy behind you and fire on him and then flip forward again. So the asteroids are taking the place of the ground. Well, in aerial combat, there's another thing, and it's called energy management. So when you have altitude, you have this kinetic energy, right? So you trade that kinetic energy for speed, and then you lose that speed for that kinetic energy, right? So you have this energy envelope that every aircraft has, and it's either the diving and climbing or turning and, you know, Every aircraft fits in the maneuverability factor inside of this energy envelope. I hope I said that right. I probably said it kind of confusing. So I'm going to take two aircraft. I'm going to say, all right, zero versus Thunderbolt. Two polar opposites, right? Zero slow, big wing area, very maneuverable, and it had a very high climb rate at a very low speed. Thud. Huge engine, lots and lots of weight, big, heavy aircraft, and not really able to turn. Zero able to turn, thud not able to turn. Zero very good down low, thud very good up high. Okay, so you have a thud, a thunderbolt, a jug, whatever you want to call it, and a zero, an A6M, whatever. And you've got them at the similar altitudes, right? Zero is flying down in its range, which is in the lower, you know, under 15,000 feet, let's say, just for the sake of having a hypothetical situation. And the Thunderbolt's up at 25,000 feet. The Thunderbolt wants to take out the zero. It's going to do something called a boom and zoom. It's going to trade its kinetic energy for speed, dive on the zero, usually in a slashing attack, and then as it blows up the zero, zero's got a squadron, you know, a squad mate, he's going to lift his nose up real high and use all that speed to trade for altitude to gain separation from that zero. Okay, so the zero is shot down, the other zero is sitting there waiting to take on the jug. So let's take the other situation, okay? Jug's up here by itself, two zeros down low, jug starts to dive on it. If the situational awareness is such that these guys know he's coming, what they should do is they should break, right? That way, as the jug comes down, the zero breaks, one of them to the right, pulls high and back. So as the jug comes down, that zero has a few tenths of a second to squeeze off a couple of rounds of 20 millimeter shells at it. So let's say the jug isn't a really good pilot. Let's say that he's flying along, he dives, the zero turns, and the jug starts getting into a turning fight. The zero is just going to stay in that turn because it eventually will have a rate of turn that will get him back on the jug's tail. And there are pilots that have died this way in battle, not knowing their aircraft. So energy management in World War II fighters and jet fighters is very important. In Star Citizen, there's not going to be any energy management that we know of. It's going to be different, right? We're going to have Newtonian physics. Now, there's going to be some things that are going to matter. The weight of a ship is going to matter. The thrust available by the thrusters and by the main thruster, so by the Maneuvering thrusters and by the main thruster is going to be very important because it's going to depict a couple of things. 
how quickly you could change your velocity vector and how quickly you can move that big massive ship around. I always use that big giant cutlass as an example. It's got a ton of maneuvering jets. It's really not that heavy because it's not armored and it's going to be like that zero and be able to spin around. Then you're looking at something like the Hornet, which is a true all-round combat aircraft. It's like the Jug. Jug. It's really heavy, has a lot of weapons, and it might not have as much thrust to maneuver. So I'm wondering in the dogfighting module, in Arena Commander, how are we going to keep this fun? And when I'm thinking about it, the fun part of it is going to be able to learn how to use those techniques that you see in the Battlestar Galactica TV show. How are you going to be able to spin your ship around the axis, how quickly you can do it, and how well you can do that and change your velocity vector at the same time. In other words, turn, right? It's going to be taking the energy envelope is going to be, you know, away. It's going to be adding in something that's going to be more of learning how to utilize all the axes of your spaceship at once to try to gain the edge over your opponent. This is the dilemma now. The game is being made to work from a various number of different control methods. Single joystick, joystick and throttle, joystick, throttle and pedals, and mouse and keyboard, and the gamepad. When I was on uh, the Geek Domos, well, I, it's actually Geek Dome on a bunch of other people. When I was on StarCast, I said, it looks like the pad is going to be the best one to do this. And I think I'm wrong. I think that when you look at mouse and keyboard, I'm going to dissect it and talk a little bit about War Thunder. In War Thunder, when you use a mouse and keyboard, there is an AI pilot flying the aircraft and you're inputting what you want him to do with the mouse and keyboard. And then that pilot tries to make that happen, right? It, you think that you're flying the plane, but actually that instructor is flying the plane. In Star Citizen, you're going to be flying with the mouse and keyboard. If you have a throttle, a stick, and pedals, you have four appendages, lots of fingers, with which to touch different controls and make things happen. I think that a good HOTUS system in the right hands is probably going to be the best thing to use for this game which is why I ordered the X-55 Rhino, and I can't wait for that to come. But the whole energy thing not being there means that you're going to have to learn how to and when to make those really, really intense maneuvers. And I see these maneuvers being, you know, we, we did them in, I think it was Wing Commander 3, when you had the arrow, you could spin it sideways and strafe along the side of a big ship. And those are going to be the type of things that I think that the arena commander is going to get us used to before the game. So for a while there, it sounded like I was probably going to knock the air combat, the space combat system in this game. I'm not. I'm going to wait and see what happens as we get closer and closer to launch and as we play arena commander over and over and over and over again, right? I think it's going to be fun. I think that it's going to wind up being intense, exciting, engaging, and dynamic, ever-changing, right? So I also want to point out something. Every one of Chris Roberts' games has had some kind of simulator built into it. Um, I should say every one of the Wing Commander series and Star um, Lancer did also. And it wasn't always the funnest part of the game. I can't tell you how many times I actually played the cute little um, arcade looking machine space simulator in Wing Commander, maybe one to ten times. You know, I can't remember. And I had that game forever. And I played it on three different platforms, Amiga, Amiga CD32, and the PC. And I still probably only played it about ten times. Star Lancer, I played it once before each mission to figure out which ship would be good to get. That means that I played it probably about 10 or 15 times. But those parts of the game weren't fun. It was because it was a virtual, you know, it was a, it was a game, right? It was a simulator. 
What's going to separate the arena commander from that is the multiplayer, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, four and four, and the tournament style play that we're going to be able to have inside of it. So I was kind of weary about it at first until I realized, hey, this is going to be cool because you're not going to be going against AI. I mean, you can. You're going to be going against your friends and enemies, and that's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to Arena Commander, and I can't wait for it to land in the next, I hope, two to three weeks. Um, I also hope that I get my X55 when I'm supposed to in June. That way I can start playing it the right way next month when that happens. All right, so we got a lot going on, right? And not a lot of news coming out. And here comes the next great Starship contest. And I've been high on this contest, and I think it has a lot of wonderful particip participants. And this week, two drop out for different reasons, their own reasons. And then we have three that are, well, that are, well, I, I don't want to give names because I want you guys to be able to watch it. But you have two that move on and three that got eliminated. So in one episode, you're down five groups that some of you all and might have been rooting for at least looking at as a second or third place, right? And they're all gone. I mean, this is the star, next great starship version of the Red Wedding. I mean, every player is all of a sudden gone and you're left with two. Well, we're going to be able to vote um, one or two back in after this week's episode. And I think that came because there was like this thought process that you were going to be able to do this in 16 weeks. But even CIG can't get a ship done in 16 weeks, right? We've seen that happen. Um, Mustang is taking longer than that. Retaliator, Gladiator, the M50, the Caterpillar, the Starfarer, all those, all those ships are taking forever, right? And I guess when they added those three shows in for the dogfighting module, it didn't push back. They superseded it. They took the place of those three episodes. So they had to get rid of more, more contestants in one full swoop. I'll have to, I have to tell you this, on Friday after I watched it, I was kind of down because I was rooting for some of them. I mean, I really wanted them to be in, the, you know, to see what they would bring to the finals or the last couple of shows. But, you know, after waiting about three days, I'm over that and I understand why it has to happen this way. They've got to get this over and done with and hopefully there'll be a season two at some point and they'll let one or two of these groups come back in. So go out there, watch last week's episode. When all of the episodes are done, I'm going to go back and do an in-depth review of the show. So far, I'm pretty engaged in it and like it. There have been some things that annoyed me, but most of those are done, and it's been pretty cool since. This past week, I met up with Dr. Hawk from Star Citizen FM. We got on... Um, we got on Skype and we recorded another show, and this one's audio only, but I'm still going to put it in my feed. I would like for all of you to take a look at it, give it a thumbs up if you like it, and give us what we should call that show. We're going to do that as a podcast and also drop the feed, you know, drop it in each other's feed. Once you give us a show name, we're going to push it out to whatever service we choose to host the podcast, and you'll be able to listen to it on your favorite MP3 device, whatever your phone might be or your MP3 device might be. Last couple of things. We have the, well, we have the Confession of Star Citizen Attic Contest going. I'm gonna read another one today, and then in the next show, I'm gonna announce the winner. I also have an extra large hoodie that doesn't fit me. I tried it on once and said, forget it, and I ordered another one, a large, which fit me awesome. So, if you want that extra large for yourself or somebody else, all you have to do is send me in a screenshot of something wacky, funny, interesting, you know, character with speech bubble, whatever, of you, you in your hangar, um, doing whatever, saying whatever. And I'm going to pick the five best, throw them into the Star, Star Citizen AA forums, and let y'all pick who is the best one and give that um, hoodie to whoever that person is. I think that would be fun. The address to send the screenshots to is theaddictedgamer at gmail.com. That's all I got for you this week. 
I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but outside of that, I guess the most interesting thing I could talk about is the fact that we have 400 and I think it's 445,000 star citizens now, which makes us one of the bigger MMOs. And we don't even have a working arena commander dogfighting module or game yet. That makes me wonder how many people are going to be in it within a month after arena commander goes live. I am thinking that we're going to have a lot of people in this game, being that it is a Chris Roberts game and he doesn't do anything small, he does them grand, and that they're interesting and they're fun and they're engaging. Well, that's my thought for the week. You all be safe out there. Thank you for watching. You have a great day. Bye. This confession is from a Carrick, and he asked not to be included in the contest, so I'm going to leave it up to him. If he should win the contest, he will be giving away his prize to the person of his choice that has entered the contest. I'll make all the names available when it's time to give out the prize. So should he win, we'll just give it to whoever he chooses. So here we go. I heard about Chris Roberts' new game, Star Citizen, in October 2012 but at the time was in the process of planning a trip for my brother, several members of Iron Fist and myself to attend PAX East 2013. Since most of my spare funds were being used on the upcoming trip, I would promised myself that I would wait to pledge until after the trip was paid for. On November 13th, my trip was finalized and my budget left me with enough spending money to pledge for the $250 Rear Admiral package on the RSI website. At the time, I considered this pledge to be a substantial amount of money for any single game. Since my budget was spent and I was now tight on money, I entered a self-declared exile from all things Star Citizen so that I wouldn't talk myself into spending more money. Fast forward a few months to PAX East 2013. I was walking down a hallway at the Boston Expo Center with my brother when I realized that a few meters in front of me was Chris Roberts participating in an interview with a gaming website. For the first time in my life, I experienced being starstruck. My internal debate regarding whether or not I should try to meet him left me feeling like a rambling idiot. Luckily, I was far enough away that only my brother had the chance to laugh at my hysteria. Eventually, Chris's interview ended and I stepped forward to take the opportunity and briefly speak with Chris. This encounter was easily one of the coolest experiences in my life. Chris was extremely humble and attentive while I told him how much I enjoyed his previous works, having played Freelancer and Wing Commander 4. He also thanked me for believing in his dream and supporting it with my pledge. While we spoke, his passion for Star Citizen and the universe he is now creating completely energized me and left me with an indescribable excitement for Star Citizen's future. Later that day, several members of Iron Fist and I attended a PAX panel where Chris was guest speaking. At some point in the panel, there was a question where Chris was asked something regarding his approach to player feedback. Now the gamers were responsible for a large amount of the game's funding. At the time, we hadn't even reached 9 million. His response continues to be the same response he gives even today. But at the time, it was my first time hearing it. Immediately, I turned to my fellow Iron Fisters and told them something along the lines of, I can't believe I was satisfied with being a rare admiral. This is not acceptable. Going forward, I will throw every spare penny I can in support of Chris Roberts and Star Citizen. After PAX, my pledging started small and escalated at a crazy pace to various Star Citizen ship sales and events that were experienced in 2013. When the June 24-hour live stream had started, I was a few dollars short of being Vice Admiral. By the end of that event, I was a proud owner of an Idris P and a selection of other ships putting me well into the High Admiral tier. From there, my pledging became more focused and strategic. Part of this was the process of tightening my budget, removing most of my non-Star Citizen-related fund spending. This allowed me to pledge far more than someone in my occupation would normally be capable of. And by the time that Star Citizen Con rolled around, I was a very proud Space Marshal. After talking with fellow Star Citizens at the 2013 Citizen Con and the unofficial Spider Con event, I figured that if I could get my hands on the Wing Commander package, 
I would be content with my pledging and could consider my role in the funding process fulfilled. This was silly of me because once I reached Wing Commander, I felt suddenly compelled to finish my title collection and achieve Completionist. Surely after reaching Completionist, I would be done, right? <laughs> Not a chance. I am now staring into the vastness of space, waiting for future ships to make themselves available so that I can add them to my collection and further develop my addiction to the best damn space simulator ever. Chris, Rob, and Eric have all said at different points 